Okay, there's one more thing that I want to illustrate that's a part of this process. Now, I mentioned these transitional states for OSPF, initializing, two-way, exchange, start, exchange, loading, and full. And I want to be able to illustrate those. So if you ever need to capture it and you want to know what takes place in any given portion of this process, this is going to be the way that I'll actually recommend you guys doing it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into CSR1 and I want to verify that I do have that adjacent. So we can see, I'll repeat the show command here. I have a neighbor that is neighbor 0002. I have a full state. That's the final state of the process. So ultimately I need to go to full. I have said that this device that I'm connected to, so R2 is the backup designated router, and we can see that device's address that it's using to form this neighbor relationship with me. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say shut. And I'm going to shut this interface down. Now, this is going to result in my link dying. So if I do a show IP OSPF neighbors, what we're going to see here is ultimately this guy should fail. So it's, did I pick the right interface? So state change to down. Let me double check and make sure I'm on the right interface. G01, it is now dead. So let's see what we got going on here. So it still says I have a neighbor. So I'm just waiting for it to detect the failure. Do show IP OSPF neighbor. I have no neighbor here. Finally, it detected it. So again, we're waiting for those timers. So show IP OSPF interface G1, the timer that we're waiting for is that 40 seconds of dead. Now we'll talk about how we can go to sub-second hellos to accelerate this process of I detecting a link failure the moment that we get into um, some of the more advanced portions of this. But consider 10 seconds is, is supposed to be a fast timer in OSPF. Now what I want to do is now that this link is gone, show IP OSPF neighbor, what I want to do is just verify that I have no neighbor. And what I want to do is I want to review this process. So I'm going to say debug IP OSPF, and I'm going to debug the adjacency process. And I'm going to go ahead and hit okay, enter here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back over here and turn this interface back on. So no shut. And what we're going to do is we're going to observe this process. And then what I want to do is I want to take an analytical look at the results. So ultimately what I want to do is I want to bring this interface up and I need to transition. So we, not, we notice here we went, now the interface is up. Then what we're going to do is we want to transition through the OSPF process until such time that we bring our connection from loading to full. So this tells me that I have an adjacency. Now I'm going to say over here, you all to turn off my debugging. Now let's take a look at this process. So all the way up to the very beginning, what we're going to see here is, is we formed a neighbor relationship. Now, I walked us through this process. We go from the initializing state to two-way. The reason that we go to the two-way state is, is that we see our router ID in the hello message coming from our OSPF speaking neighbor. On this segment, we trigger what is referred to as a neighbor change event. In other words, we're coming up from no neighbor to having a neighbor. And since this is a broadcast interface, we are going to elect a designated router and a backup designated router. Now, given the fact that I only have two devices on this Ethernet segment, I'm pretending that I have like an Ethernet WAN configuration here, what will end up happening is, is I will only have these two types of configuration, a DR and a BDR, and that's the only thing that are elected. Ultimately, the DR is going to be in charge on that segment. And then what will end up happening is, is we will actually denote that and specify that we elected the device that has the router ID of 0002 as the BDR and 0001 is the DR. Now, once that's done, we have formed an adjacency and we have confirmed the fact that we agree on these configurations. So we see the ID values here. And then once that takes place, what we're going to do is we are now going to go into the exchange start phase. Now, remember I mentioned that in the exchange start phase, we exchange something called database descriptors. Now, the database descriptors are like summarizations of all of the prefix that a given device knows about, and we're going to actually exchange them.
As part of this process, we are going to elect someone to be in charge of the process, and this is going to allow us to be able to elect a slave and a master. Now, what we see here is, is we, are, we have done this NBR, this neighbor negotiation process, and we have been elected to be the slave. When I say we, we're talking about CSR 1. And as a direct result of us being the slave, we are going to send our updates to the master, which is 0002. So in this process, we're going to send this information across. Now, once we've exchanged database descriptors, we will actually transition to the exchange state. Now, the exchange state is going to be where the device on the other end has listed or seen my list of database descriptors, and it is now going to request updates for the prefixes that it does not know about. But as a direct result of this process, we have to pay attention to this idea of MTU. And in this instance, we're using MTUs of 1500 on these devices, and we will want to make certain that those are going to match. Now, as a part of this process, in exchange, what we're doing is we're actually sending those updates, the LSUs. And keep in mind, the LSUs contain the LSAs, the ad advertisements, of which we have seen only one, type 1 LSAs. We go through this process. It takes place bidirectionally. And then basically what ends up happening is, is that we go through the entire process. Once we've exchanged those hellos, I'm sorry, once we've exchanged those link state updates, and we've synchronized our database, so we've received a link state update from our neighbor, and it had two prefixes in it. And what we're going to do is we have now synchronized our databases such that they are now uniform across our area. And therefore, we're going to transition from the loading, i.e. loading the, the prefix information, to the full state. Ultimately, we go through this entire process and we make certain that everything is updated. Now, as a direct result of this, what I have done is I have compiled another very, very important construct when it comes to routing. And we've talked about this a dozen times. So keep in mind that we have a router, a device. So let's just say this is R1. Now R1 is going to have some interfaces on it. So like gigabit one, gigabit two. It must be noted and kept very clear in our mind the fact that this device is actually subdivided. In fact, if I were to draw a line right across this router. That line is going to describe the border between what is referred to as the control plane and what is referred to as the data plane. Now, we capture intelligence. And the purpose of exchanging these link state updates are so that I can actually take the information that is being exchanged and place it inside of a database. So whenever I start talking about intelligence, for the most part, I'm describing some type of database. We call this database the RIB, the Routing Information Base. And in OSPF, it's also important to note that we have something called the OSPF database. Now, the OSPF database is going to be a listing of all of the prefixes that I've learned and how I learned them. And that's going to be based on what we refer to as our LSAs, our link state advertisements, of which we have 11 of them that we're going to focus on in this class. But in the beginning, we're only going to start with the first five. And we've talked about the first one, the type 1 LSA. It is important to note that a type 1 LSA is going to be advertised by every device that is configured as an OSPF, OSPF speaker. So that's going to be type ones are going to be advertised by all OSPF routers. There is also a type two LSA and the type two LSA identifies the device that is going to be elected or has been elected the DR. So in this instance on CSR one, we knew that it was elected as the designated router and the other device, CSR2, was elected as the backup designated router.
we'll get into this process shortly. But it's important to note that type 2 LSAs are only advertised by designated routers. And they only exist on interface types that are broadcast in nature. And we're going to get into the wide range of OSPF network types, of which we have in the beginning point to point, and we have the idea of broadcast. But keep in mind, there's point to multipoint, there's non-broadcast connect configurations and hybrids that we can go through. Some Cisco proprietary, some not. Now, another part of this entire component or this entire mechanism is going to be the fact that we have other databases. So remember, I said we had the data plane. Now, in the data plane, a lot of times what we want to do is we want to be able to forward information at line rate. So in other words, as fast as humanly possible. And line rate configuration is normally constrained to hardware. And whenever we're talking about hardware, we're talking about ASIC, Application Specific Integrated Circuits. And it's important to note that we have a database in the data plane called the FIB, the Forwarding Information Base. Now, these aren't the only databases that we have. Later on, we're going to talk about a LIB, a Label Information Base, and we're going to talk about an LFIB, a Label Forwarding Information Base. But it's very, very important that we keep all of this stuff in mind. And what we're doing is we're using this exchange process. The adjacency state machine dictates who can exchange prefixes with whom and how. And it's going to be through the use of these LSAs that we're actually going to be able to compile first the OSPF database. And then what we do is we run Dijkstra's shortest path first algorithm against that database and we compute our routing information base. And then what ends up happening for the most part is, is that the information in the rib is actually going to be copied to the FIB and that database is going to be used for data plane forwarding. It also gives me things like non-stop forwarding and processes like graceful restart. So there's a lot of stuff to keep in mind, and we're going to have a lot of conversation about OSPF. And we've only just skimmed the service. So the main goal here is, is to understand that this is applicable to any portion of the lab, whether we're talking about troubleshooting, whether we're talking about diagnostics, or whether we're talking about the configuration section. So keep in mind, there's nothing in this process that is considered to be untouchable in any of those three categories. In fact, I would so go far, as far as to say that when it comes to what we're discussing right now, you will see it in every one of these sections. I think it's a fair bet that you're going to get asked a diagnostic question. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, OSPF will be in both the troubleshooting and the configuration section. So without even violating or coming close to violating the NDA, I'm telling you the significance of understanding what's happening the moment we turn OSPF on and understanding it not necessarily purely from a perspective of theory, but understanding it from the perspective of diagnostics and operations. So everything that we need to do, we need to look at it from the per perspective of how does it look when it's working? Because if you don't understand what it looks like when it's working, you really, really are not going to be good at identifying what's wrong when it isn't working and the idea of being able to troubleshoot. Now, in my perspective, troubleshooting almost always begins with the control plane because it's the control plane that drives the data plane. So prefixes that are going to be included, i.e. I'm going to be in, inserting or sending information to a specific destination. When it comes to the routing protocol, those destinations are going to be learned as part of our control plane. And every protocol and feature that we have has some control plane element, whether we're talking about routing in, uh, the RIP protocol, whether we're talking about EIGRP, whether we're talking about OSPF, and then later on, you're going to find out there's a whole plethora of options when it comes to protocols like border gateway protocol. So again, don't lose sight of what we're talking about right now, but I did want you guys to see this transitional process where we go from initializing all the way to full. It's important to note that there's also another state called attempt that is only going to be used if I am using unicast neighbor formation, which we'll be talking about later on in this series. But just keep all of this in the back of your mind and make certain that you have a very, very firm understanding of exactly what's taking place
in something as simple as just bringing up OSPF neighbors. So with that being said, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave you with this. Maybe you can rewatch this video, maybe go through the lab, take a look at some of the Wireshark outputs inside of the T-Labs uh, pods or on your own personal rack. And until then, I really, really hope you guys get the opportunity to go through all of this with a fine tooth comb because at the end of the day, it's the foundations that cause people to fail the lab. If you do not have a firm grasp of the foundations, that's the reason people fail. It has very, very little to do with what Narbic always calls the 007 scenarios. I mean, you're going to run into them, but if you can't handle it, that's not why you failed. I mean, ultimately, it might be the straw that broke the camel's back, but nine times out of ten, you can walk away from a... Uh, very, very corner case scenario or situation, unless that's a, it's a transit scenario. We're going to talk about mechanisms to bypass that. So with that being said, I will see everybody in the next video where we're going to talk about a little bit more about these link state advertisements. And we're going to focus on the ones that we're currently working with that are specifically type 1s and type 2s and how they are constrained.